With Earth Day, everybody's mind right now is on the environment, but how many people are actually thinking about what's on their plate versus all of the trash that they're putting out every week? Well, it turns out that more than a quarter of the world's greenhouse gas emissions go directly to the diets that we choose. And so on today's show, we are going to talk all about your food and the environment and the ramifications that come with it. And to talk with us about that today is Dr. Neil Barnard. Sir, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Chuck. This is really an overlooked point. You, you think about the environment, you think about emissions from a car, you think about the trash that you see on the highway when you are driving, you think about even the polluted seas, but you're not really thinking about what you had for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Yes, and but by comparison, the trash that you see by the roadside and so forth, the straw that was you know in your, your soda that might go into the ocean, those things are actually trivial compared to the magnitude of effect that we see from our, our day-to-day diet changes. Now, that doesn't mean we want trash, we want straws thrown in the ocean, we wanna clean that up too. But if that's all we are doing, then we are really not working for the environment. And I know that there has now been uh, a lot of research that is diving into this. It seems like there's been more and more over the past couple of decades uh, in looking exactly at what it is that we're talking about today. And hopefully there's still more to come. But what do we know right now as far as what the difference is in terms of environmental uh, health uh, when you look at a plant-based diet versus the standard American or Western diet? I have to tell you, Chuck, this, this is something that that is relatively new in the public discourse but is, all, is also something that's been a dirty little secret uh, that many people knew about for a really, really long time. And I'm talking about when I get on a plane and go back to where I grew up, I grew up in North Dakota and I get off the, the plane in Fargo and drive down the road and all along this side of the highway is corn. And it's, it's as far as the eye can see and it's, it's really beautiful. Every corn plant is, identical. They're all genetically modified corn plants. And on this side of the highway, it's all soybeans. And it's as far as the eye can see, and it's gorgeous because every plant is is planted in these rows. Each plant is, is genetically modified and identical. And the key here is that that enormous acreage is never going to feed one human being. All of it is hog feed, chicken feed, and cattle feed. And so to make a burger, you have to feed a huge amount of feed grains into the cow uh, to get a little bit of meat out. And that's true for chicken, it's true for pork. And to raise those feed grains, you need an enormous amount of irrigation. Uh, the amount of irrigation that is required to make about one pound of beef is about 5,000 gallons of water. That's, that's how much ends up being applied day after day, month after month, year by year after year on the corn, on the soybeans to grow them up and then the cows eat them. Uh, but Chuck, the, the real problem then is that when the irrigation goes on the plants, it picks up the fertilizer and the pesticides that were applied also. And it washes into the streams that washes into the river and eventually it goes down the Mississippi and is flushed out underneath Louisiana and Texas into the Gulf of Mexico. And all of those chemicals that have, that have been used to raise these products um, end up creating a dead zone. And the dead zone now, as of 2021, is about as big as the state of New Jersey mm. in, in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm talking, well, I'm talking dead. I'm talking about the fish don't grow there, the plants don't grow there. Um, mm. It's been killed off by our, because of our penchant for chicken breast. It, this dead zone, is it pretty close to where the river empties into the Gulf or is there yeah. a stream that, that carries it out a little bit further? Um, it, it, it's out a little bit further, but but it is, we are almost literally just flushing our trash down down this big toilet that, 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 that used to be called the Gulf of Mexico. Mm. Um, and here's the beauty of it though, Chuck. Let's say people decided, I'm not going to eat that anymore. I'll put my tomato sauce and my spaghetti or something like that instead of the meat sauce. Um, I'll have instead of a chicken salad sandwich, make mine hummus. You still have to grow some plants, but the amount that you need is dramatically less 
than what you need if you're going to feed all the feed grains to the animals to get the meat out. And so all of that acreage that I see in my childhood home of North Dakota, you wouldn't need anywhere near that acreage to grow to grow food if people ate the plants directly. And some of it could be used for vegetables and grains and beans and fruits. Some of it could go back to prairie. Some of it could go to forest. And, and that's true in Nebraska and it's true in Kansas and it's true throughout North and South America. Um, think of the Amazon rainforests. You don't need to be burning them if you're not gonna be raising feed grains for, for cattle anymore. You said 5,000 gallons for a pound of red meat, correct? Yeah, that's right. Uh, so have there been any really accurate detailed studies looking at that head to head versus what it would be for a pound of beans, say? Oh my goodness sakes, it's dramatically less, it's dramatically less. Um, and uh, to put this into context, if you were to brush your teeth and leave the faucet running, you know, and, and so uh, your roommate is looking at you, you know, why, why aren't you conserving water or whatever, um, that's about a gallon of water. Um, if you were to wash your car and really do it thoroughly, maybe 55 gallons. Um, but a person who's having just one ounce of beef is wasting so much water. Um, it, is, it is really astounding. But again, the, the big problem here is not just the water wastage. It's all of the chemicals that go with it from the fertilizers and the pesticides too. Not to mention the fact that the cows are metabolizing beings. They're belching methane into the atmosphere. Yeah, let's stick with the with the beef industry really quickly. This is a pretty interesting one. I, I believe it was last year. Uh, there was uh, this is just the. I mean, it, it's mind boggling that this was actually a thing. Uh, I, do you remember the ads Burger King put out about their uh, essentially environmentally friendly Whopper, um, where they had cows that were supposedly producing less methane? Yes, I. I, I yes. Um, the, the word humane washing kind of comes to, or green washing kind of comes to mind. Exactly. Yeah. I remember speaking with uh, Dr. Martin Heller, who we've had on the show this week as well. And he was telling me that they did a gross over-exaggeration uh, over -exaggeration of the benefits of whatever the feed change was that they were giving these cows versus what, what the standard cow goes. And they said that it, it, it cut it... I, I'm just going to throw this out there. Don't quote me on it. Cut it by a third is what they were proclaiming. But in actuality, it was a fraction of a percent of right. a difference here. Uh, and, and you talk about greenwashing. That's exactly what that was. And of course, we're talking about a Whopper and we're talking about beef. So when we're looking at the meat industry as, as a whole, is beef the real big offender here? Um, beef is, is a big offender. Now, when I was talking about those fields in North Dakota, they're feeding cattle, they're feeding pigs, they're feeding chickens. So all animal agriculture is a big problem, including fish. Um, but the issue with, with cows is, is sort of more specific because they're ruminant animals. And so they eat a very, very high fiber diet and they've, um, in, in their digestive tract, which is a little bit different from yours and mine, they are producing methane that they then belch out. And if you modify their feed so that it has a different fiber content, different carbohydrate content, you can, you can adjust up or down the methane output a little bit. But as Dr. Heller said, the difference is trivial. And if you are a meat eater, you are not an environmentalist. You can pretend to be one, but it's a lie. Um, however, a switch from beef to fish is not a vote for the environment. A switch from beef to chicken is not a vote for the environment. Uh, many people have pointed out the disasters that, that those industries have as well, I'm sorry to say. And I believe you said something about we, we in America eat a million chickens an hour or something outrageous like that? It's exactly the number, that's right. So you're thinking about 24 million chickens every single day uh, 365 days out of the year. I'm not going to do the math, but I would imagine that that too takes an enormous amount of feed and resource to be able to grow that many chickens. Um, yes. Uh, you don't get a thousand chickens per hour down the American esophagus um, by having them frolic over the hillsides and, and eat whatever they find in the forest and so forth. They're not ordering room service either. Um, the chickens are... In, You've seen the pictures. Um, they are fed in an industrial fashion. They're fed feed grains that are grown for that purpose. So that requires fertilizer, pesticides, um, all, and of course, a huge amount of irrigation. 
Um, but Chuck, I have to say, I think one of the big wrong turns people make, going to chicken is a huge wrong turn. I think everybody realizes that. Um, they know it's not environmental, it's not healthy. Um, but a lot of people have this imagination that somehow if you are eating only fish, that maybe you're almost an environmentalist. But people have started to look at, at what happens. How, how do you scoop up a huge number of fish out of the ocean and, and get them on your plate? And one of the most troubling uh, ones that, that we have looked at is what's called bottom trawling. Uh, it's an enormous net that functions basically like a scoop. And a boat drops it down to the ocean floor and drags it along. And sometimes two boats will, will drag them together. And it's effectively like running a lawnmower through a forest. Just what's ever down on the bottom, you pick up, which is target species, but also the fish species that weren't your targets and the octopuses and, and the other animals all end up in the net and then they're hauled up and the trash species are discarded and the target ones are sold. And people learned about this years ago uh, with other kinds of nets like purse seine nets where you scoop them up just like a, a purse with a drawstring and here are all the tuna you wanted and oops, here are the dolphins too. Um, they, they are extremely unselective. Uh, the, this, the bottom trawling destroys the animals, it destroys the coral reefs, it destroys the ocean bottom. And so many, many people are now sounding alarm saying that if you're an environmentalist, fish is the first thing that you want to stop eating. Okay, but then I think that somebody who is a fish enthusiast would say, well, the oceans are so big and you're talking about trawling just a small percentage of it. Really, what harm, what damage can be done if you're just operating in this, this small little confined area of the ocean? What is the effect on the ecosystem? Well, in, in, the, the effect is not small. The effect is enormous. Um, keep in mind that we are feeding billions and billions and billions of people through this uh, through the system. And uh, the fishing industry is highly competitive industry where you have different countries all fighting about who gets what territory. And the effect on the environment is huge. Let me give you another um, way of looking at this. Environmentalists are all used to going into the fast food restaurant and saying, don't give me that plastic straw because that plastic straw is going to end up in the ocean. It goes from the trash into the oceans. We don't want to have that because they've seen pictures of how straws end up washing into certain areas and the, the fish can end up swallowing them, that kind of stuff. Um, the contribution of straws to the plastics in the ocean is, is dramatically less than even 1%. What's all the plastic in the ocean? It's, it's fishing nets and fishing materials that have been used, cut off, discarded. Uh, as much as 40% of the plastic in the oceans is just the refuse from the fishing industry itself. And if you're ever along the beach and you see the remnants of a fishing net, you can see how unselective it is. It's drifting along in the ocean. And even if it's not connected to the boats anymore, the fish still get caught in it. And so it's killing uh, for decades and decades and decades after it has been used. Um, one last thing, Chuck. When I was a kid growing up in North Dakota, we used to get in the Chevy Impala and drive over to the Minnesota lakes. And we would cast out our, our lines. And somehow, you know, you would never think about um, driving a, a hook through the, the cheek of a, of a chicken or of a cow, because you'd say that's extraordinarily painful. That's exactly what we did. Every time we would catch a trout or a walleye or, or a northern pike or the other, the other animals that we would pull up. And I, I'm, I have to say, I'm always impressed by kids nowadays who are saying, that's just cruel. I don't want that. Give me the veggie burger instead. Um, so I, I think that when we start to add up the environmental concerns, the humane concerns, and frankly, the fact that Chinook salmon has about as much cholesterol and, and saturated fat as beef does, uh, it makes a pretty strong case for leaving the fish off our plate too. And you know what? I'm sitting here thinking, and you're again, going back to those, those really indiscriminate nets. And I remember, what was it? In the eighties, there was this big push to have dolphin safe tuna because the right. dolphins were being caught in the tuna nets. And it sounds like here, if you're going for salmon or whatever the other fish is, 
you were just mentioning that the Dolphins are probably going to get scooped up in these nets as well. Yeah, that was the, the whole idea was that if you get our brand of tuna, we're going to have spotters and, and so forth who are going to try to keep the Dolphins out. It, I have to say it has really been shown to be largely fictional. Um, in, in the in, These are industries that are highly competitive. They want to get the tuna on your plate. They do not care if dolphins are, are killed or not in the process. And the, the, the certifications are utterly and completely meaningless. Um, that said, let me also uh, make a pitch for the tuna. If you have a heart for a dolphin and you don't want them to suffer, yeah, maybe, you know, what about the tuna? Let's, let's speak up for the tuna as well while we're at it. That's a fair point. Um, let's go back. You know, the tuna union saying, hey, you know, we count too. Hey, you know, my wife can organize them in a heartbeat. Um, so here's here's the question. I know that there was a study done a few years ago. I believe it was in 2016 and looked at the, the connection between um, not just what uh, the effect would be on the environment, but also on uh, people's health if the world switched to a plant-based diet. And one of the things that they concluded was really kind of fascinating to me. It said, well, number one, if the entire world, as optimistic as this sounds, but if the entire world were to adopt a plant-based diet by the year 2050, so roughly 30 years from now, global mortality would decrease by 10%. But get this, food-related greenhouse gas emissions would decrease by 70%. That seems to me to be a key figure, a large figure, and a figure that really we should be striving for when we always hear about these reports that we're on the brink of not being able to undo the damage that we've done. We've gone too far. But if we're able to drop it by 70% over the next three decades, you got to figure that's going to do a world of good. It's also the easiest choice to make. We can wait for people to cap their smokestacks. We can wait for Detroit to make uh, more fuel efficient cars. But you can change what you're having for lunch today. Um, so that's the beauty of it. It's extremely empowering to be able to make those choices. Absolutely. So as people here, uh, we kind of wrap things up here. As people really weigh uh, what it is that they're eating here and you sit down and you look at your plate. Matter of fact, you know what? Let me ask it this way. Uh, you had this epiphany. You grew up very much in, in a beef loving uh, part of, of the nation here. And you obviously grew up eating red meat yourself. Mm -hmm. at, at what point did you look down at your plate and realize, hey, what I'm eating here not just impacts my my own health, but the health of the environment. Do you remember the first time that everything kind of clicked for you and what those thoughts were, what emotions you were feeling? Well, you know, I have to say, I want to give credit where credit's due. Francis Moore LePay wrote a book decades ago called Diet for a Small Planet. And it was something that people read, they talked about, but I think they might have forgotten. Um, but, but her argument was really very simple. It was just, we can raise a lot of grains, feed them to animals and get a little bit of meat out that we can, that we can eat. But if we eat the grains directly and the vegetables and the fruits and, and the, the bounty of botanical foods, not only will we have plenty for ourselves, but plenty to feed a hungry world. And so I remember hearing about that and thinking that it, it's obviously logical and obviously true. Um, the problem I think I might have had in my own life is that my own <laughs> extended family's business, and all my uncles and cousins, and not to mention my grandpa and my dad and everybody as far back as I can trace, was, was actually in the animal agricultural business. But we grow, we change, and we discover that the benefits are huge. Oh, you black vegan sheep, you. you. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Neil Barnard, I appreciate that very much. This has been really enlightening. And uh, we will go ahead and drop a link to the uh, study that I was referencing there, that 2016 study. We'll drop that in the episode notes for you as well, so you can check that out for yourself. Dr. Barnard, thank you so very much. Thank you, Chuck. If you feel like you've raised your health IQ by a couple of points, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and leave a nice comment below. And to hear the entire interview, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your shows from and subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee. And please leave a five-star rating.